Amen. There was, a, there was a line in one of those songs, uh, now I raise my Ebenezer, and that's an interesting word, the Hebrew word is Eben Ezer, it's literally just a transliteration of a Hebrew word, and, and what that was, was a, a moment where they would lift stones together and, and create this, this rock or pillar of remembrance, and, and so that Him is talking about raising a a moment or a pillar of remembrance in our hearts, and that remembrance is the gospel, remembering the gospel. We're going to have an opportunity to remember or even raise Ebenezer's in our life in just a a couple weeks, Good Friday. Now, you all know if you've been here a while uh, that I believe Jesus actually died on Wednesday, and uh, and, and if you want to get into that discussion with me, we'll go all day with it. Um, But we still celebrate Good Friday. Because that's what we feel in our hearts, and, and we feel like that's a special time. Uh, and so, uh, Good Friday, we will be here. We will be celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper on Good Friday in a special way. And we'll be having baptisms on Good Friday. Uh, and I really want to challenge you. I've got uh, three ladies right now that are going to be baptized. I'd love to have some men that want to be baptized, all right? So talk to me. Uh, young guys, kids, I'd love to have, if you're in the room, I guess they're not in the room, most of them. Parents, talk to your kids about baptism. Uh, I'd love to see some kids baptized. Uh, and listen, if you're just, you're really old and you've never been baptized or didn't understand when you were baptized, we would love to have you baptized too. We'd love to have every generation represented when we do baptisms. Uh, so Good Friday, you can talk to me about that or talk to Pastor Eddie or Pastor Sean or Pastor Dave and we will get you ready uh, for that moment. It's going to be special. All right, we're going to get back into Ecclesiastes this morning. Twice a month, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and just a refresher, in case you're new to this study or you haven't been here for one of our previous uh, teachings on Ecclesiastes, this is the earliest philosophy book ever written. This is truly a philosophy book. Solomon is asking the deep questions of life. He's having a very existential moment. He's looking at his own life, wondering what it's worth, and realizing in all the experimentation and trying to find happiness and joy under the sun on this earth that nothing makes him happier than a deep relationship with his Lord. That's the end of the book. That's the totality of the book. And yet, I think it's good that we go chapter by chapter asking some of these deep questions of ourselves, and questioning our own worldview, our own philosophy, our own ethos or group of ethics, our own politics. And really, does our religion boil down to those things or is it gospel-centered? I think it's been an important discussion for all of us in these days. We're also taking a quick peek at a book written by a man named uh, G.K. Chesterton, yes, he is one of my favorite authors. Uh, and he was a Catholic. You might, that might surprise you. He was a believing Catholic. But he was asking deep questions at a time when Darwinian evolution was changing how we view life, culture, and religion. In the late 1800s. And I'm amazed at how often what he says could have been written today. And so I think this is an important uh, little thing to look at as well. Uh, Here's my first thought this morning, and here's what we're going to talk about. How do we keep our lives about God more than ourselves? How do we keep our lives or live our lives in such a way that we know they're more about God than ourselves? Because we're living in a world that wants to make your life about you. We were just laughing this morning, Mark and I, because this this buzz phrase, you do you, and it doesn't matter how that affects anybody else, I'm going to do me, and if you don't like it, you can stuff it, because I'm going to be me. And that may inhibit you from being you. Well, that's your problem, not my problem. So we live in this this world that's creating an egocentric view. We function in an egocentric world, which means we struggle with creating either value narratives or victim narratives. Go ahead and put that next slide up there for me, Tim. Tim. There's two prevailing narratives today. Two prevailing narratives that come out of an egocentric world. All right, here's narrative number one. And remember, narratives are the truths or stories we tell ourselves that we believe are true because we've made them true. Now, there are true narratives. The gospel is a true narrative. It's a true story about life and and, and how life was designed for you and I uh, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
The whole narrative of the gospel is a true narrative. But there are also false narratives. And we write these false narratives about our life. And they, in essence, we preach them so much to ourselves that they become true narratives for us. And here's the first one we see today. All right? This is called the value narrative. Value narratives create the view of myself that says, I deserve more from the world. This is the predominant narrative being taught both in schools and on television and in Hollywood and in music and in social media and in the news media. I deserve more from the world. I deserve more pay. I deserve more recognition. I deserve more power. I deserve more space. I deserve more sex. Whatever it is, I deserve more of it because I'm valuable and I want to be recognized for my value. Does that sound familiar? And we create whole microcosms in our life, these little parts of life that are untouchable because we want our kids to feel valued. Sports is one of these. Nothing competes more with church than sports. I'm just going to be honest with you. And can I just tell you, can I just be honest with you? I, just, I hate to break this. is bad news, I know. Your kid is not going to be a professional athlete. It's just not going to happen. Okay, and if it happens, you can prove me wrong someday, and I will apologize. I'm not above apologies. Your kid is five foot three. They're not going to be a professional basketball player. So don't place that pressure on them and, and miss out on the rest of life, including church, because there's no time for it, because my kid has to get a, a scholarship to UNC and play for the Lakers. It's not going to happen. And in throwing your life into that value system, all of a sudden it doesn't happen and your kid has no care for church because they weren't in church because they were too busy playing sports. That's not our problem. That's your problem. You took them out of church, not us. Or the value narrative that my kid has to get a scholarship because of, ed of education or whatever it is. We as parents want the best for our kids. That's natural, but we create these false value narratives for them and then they're mad when they don't get everything they want because we told them if you just do enough if you just keep going if you just don't quit you'll get everything you want in life but what if they don't a lot of current movements in our country today especially politically are created out of this value narrative that certain people deserve more. And some of this comes out of the second narrative that is being spun today out of an egocentric world, and that is this, a victim narrative. Victim narratives create the view that the world is against me. So if I don't have everything I want in value, then I've been cheated, I've been slighted, and I should get what I deserve. The world owes me something because I'm a victim. It is amazing at how many victim narratives are proliferating television right now. You watch commercials. Take, just take a day, take a notepad, and watch commercials. And in every commercial just about, you find either a value narrative or a victim narrative. You, be, you deserve more, or you've been cheated out of something you, you're owed. That's every commercial on television. That's every storyline. That's every movie right now. Every month in this country is designated to somebody who's a victim. What's well, this person's month because they're a victim, and, and now it's this person's month because they're a victim, and next month is that person's month because they're a victim. And they might truly be victims. But we spend so much time talking about how we're victims, we never stop to realize the victories. We never stop to realize how blessed we are to live in this culture. There are some great things about this moment in time. There's some really stinky things about this moment in time, but there's some great things too. We've come a long way. Here's the problem, okay? I want you to see this. The gospel narrative should be our narrative. The gospel narrative should be our narrative and inform our view of the world and of self. Worldly narratives begin the process of faith deconstruction. Worldly narratives begin the process of faith deconstruction. How so? Well, and go ahead and put that next slide up for me. I think this is the, the one here. Oh, that's the next one. I missed a whole bunch of slides for you, Tim. That's my bad. I feel totally victimized by that. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. I got it. See, I'm not valued enough around here for what I do. 
Here's the thing, okay? When we focus on one single issue, and, we fo- and it may be a value narrative and it may be a victim narrative. Let's just start with victim narratives because that's where we tend to go. Okay, this is wrong, and it might be wrong. This is really wrong, and it might be really wrong. Now, God, you need to fix this. God isn't going to fix every victim issue. In fact, that's the brokenness of the world. And so we keep pushing on that issue. Well, I'm going to bring this issue to the church, and I'm going to make this issue my poster issue on Facebook, and I'm going to live my life about this issue, and God still doesn't fix the the issue. And you know what happens? We focus so much on that issue that we magnify that issue, and that issue, when it's magnified enough, eventually in our heart and our life and our mind and our focus becomes bigger than God himself. And then you know what happens? God is too small for this issue. If God is too small for this issue, maybe God is not God. Maybe he's not big enough to be God. Maybe he's not real. And we begin the process of deconstructing our faith because what we were worshiping was a political or social issue and not God himself. And time and time again, when you trace back people deconstructing their faith, pulling apart their faith, it started with a political or social issue that they couldn't rectify with the gospel. And so they abandoned the gospel instead of the issue. Here's what Chesterton said. He says, complete self-confidence is not merely a sin. Complete self-confidence is a weakness. Why is complete self-confidence a weakness? It's a weakness because you no longer can hear outside your own mind. You think you have all the answers. And you become unteachable. And then when life falls apart because you didn't have the right answers, you don't know what to do with life. And so life is over. so much truth in this statement. Here's what he says a couple of paragraphs later. He says, we have looked for questions in the darkest corners and on the wildest peaks. We have found all the questions that can be found. It is time we give up looking for questions and begin looking for answers. You will never find all the answers you are looking for to make sense of God and faith. Every question leads to five more questions. And at some point, we as believers in this culture need to stop questioning and start questioning our questions. Because God wants to give us answers, but they're not always the answers we want. So how do we keep our lives centered on the gospel narrative? How do we keep our lives centered on the reality that I wasn't made for me and the whole world doesn't revolve around me? I was created with the purpose of glorifying God, and I can't do that in myself, so I need Jesus' righteousness because my righteousness is screwed up. Remember, I can't do the right thing in the right way for the right reason at the right time. Those are all the requirements to do something righteously. I can't do it. And so Jesus made a way. He did the right thing at the right time, in the right measure, on the right day, for the right reasons. He took my sin. He gave me his righteousness. And now I can live a purpose-filled life that revolves around him and not about me. That's the gospel narrative. How do we keep that as the narrative of our life? How do we not get off to the left and to the right with all the voices we hear in our heads and the noise of this culture? Well, Ecclesiastes 5 and 6 run together. So we're going to look at five things in these two chapters. We're going to bounce around a little bit because they aren't necessarily in order. But these five things come up again and again in these chapters. I'm going to give you the point first, and then we're going to look at the verses that go with. All right, We're going to do a little bit of reverse order this morning. And then we'll end with a good way to understand the gospel narrative practically in our life. Uh, Here's number one. Remember who you are worshiping. Remember, don't forget, you're not worshiping you. You're not worshiping a a social or political issue. You're worshiping God. Now, I do this in two ways, and Solomon articulates two ways for us to remember who we are worshiping. Here's number one way. He says, listen more than you talk. Listen more than you talk. I just saw a whole bunch of uh, husbands and wives elbowing each other, guys, that really, come on. Hear that stuff at home. Here's what he says, okay, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. 
to draw near, to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Then he says this in verse two, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. How often do you talk to God and never stop to let him talk to you? If you're not in the scriptures every day, you're probably not hearing much of God. Because we are so overrun with the voices of this world, it's hard to hear his spirit these days. But I would challenge you, when you come into this place, do as much listening as you're talking. Do as much asking of the Lord to apply the scriptures as you are singing. In your prayer life, give God at least a minute or two to speak to you through his still small voice. Read the Bible and ask him to speak out of the Bible. But when all we do is talk, we start to hear our own voice as God's voice, and then we talk ourselves into things. We talk ourselves into narratives. We talk ourselves into this idea that I deserve more or that I've been kept from something I deserve. I mean, how many times have I written a narrative about a person that I'm frustrated with because I didn't spend any time to ask God to speak to me about that relationship. And so by the end of my self-teaching and self-loathing, I have victimized that person in my heart and soul. I've created a demon out of them, and then I think they deserve all hell. When if I would have stopped and said, God, would you help me know if there's some of this is me? Is some of this my issue? Would you help me see? Because every conflict involves two people. Help me see where I can change. And help me approach this person with mercy and grace and kindness. We need to listen more than we talk. But secondly, when we talk, we need to talk about God's will more than our own wants. Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. He says, whatever has come to be has already been named And it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? If you're in conflict in life, it's probably because you've created that conflict. It's not always. It's not always. But I think often we create the conflicts that we have to walk through. And we create them because we're too busy talking about ourselves, we're talking about what we want, we're talking about what other people ought to do, we're talking about how people don't measure up, and we create these conflicts because we're not talking about the right things. Instead of talking about how God wants to use us to impact life and to serve others, and that our life is not our own, we make it about ourselves and what we deserve or what we've been kept from. And that writes the narrative of that person in our life. Church is the same way. We come to church with a lot of expectations. What church should be, what church ought to be, what they're not doing. I feel like I'm not valued enough in church. They should do this because I'm important. Or I feel like I've been victimized in church because uh, they've held something back from me that I want. And how often do we just come in into church and say, God, what do you want today? What do you want from me as I sing, as I pray, as I go to a business meeting? What do you want? This is about you. It's not about me. Number two, don't make commitments to God that you can't or won't keep. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 7 says, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. But what you vow, it is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. And he says this, let not your mouth lead you into sin. And do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. I 
I think very often in our life, because we're not listening, like we talked about on the first point, we have a dream in our life, we pray over that dream, and then we inform God how he can be a good God to us. God, if you want to be a good God, God, I'm going to worship. This needs to happen. God's up there thinking, oh, really? Because he sees where that dream leads. He sees, he sees the real cost of that dream. He sees what you're going to lose in that dream. He sees the pride that's going to come out of that dream. He sees the self-indulgence that's a result of that dream. He says, is that really? So I need to do that for you? My, my power, my glory, my majesty, that as the creator of all that exists, is relegated to your little finite dream, really? Well, yeah. Now, you set God up that way, guess what? God's going to fail your expectations, willingly. And then to you, he's not big enough to be God. Because the dream was God. Now, why are we talking about commitments here? Because if we're approaching this relationship from the egocentricity of God, the world revolves around me, we're not going to go to God with open hands and say, God, what is your will? We're going to walk up to God with a contract and ask him to sign it, right? God rips it up, gives us back a blank piece of paper. I'll sign that. And so we, we enter this, this narrative, this focus that I can show up to church Sing my songs, have coffee, serve once a month in some capacity, and then God is owed to me all the dreams that I, that I have, that I want, all the things that are supposed to happen in my life. And one of the biggest ways we lie to God, make vows to God, is by singing worship songs about grace and then living in ungratitude or approaching our personal holiness casually. So we come in here, we talk about raising our Ebenezer, which is the gospel. We talk about living our lives for him, giving our lives to him. Come thou found of every blessing. And then we focus on just the blessing. You know, Jesus is actually the blessing. Did you know that? That's actually the only blessing you're promised, is, is Jesus' presence through the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the blessing. Everything else is icing on the cake. And so I get mad. I come in here and I sing about the glorious grace of God, and then I go out and live ungraciously because I'm frustrated that God didn't perform like a song and dance monkey for me. Right? Derek Kidner, in his, in his uh, commentary on Ecclesiastes, says it this way in, from these verses. He says, grace demands gratitude, and gratitude cannot be casual. Grace demands gratitude, and gratitude cannot be casual. You can't say, I am fully in love with Jesus, and I want everything he wants for my life. I want to be on his agenda, and then live a casual life that floats in and out and, and takes the next best thing when there's something better than church. Number three. All right, here we go. He's doing it again. Don't trust in a political party to fix your social context. Don't trust a political party to fix your social context. That's in the Bible? Actually, it is. And it was written by a politician, King Solomon. Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He says in verse 8, If you see in a province the oppression of the poor, and the violation of justice and righteousness. Do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. I love when someone says, that's not my president. And my response to them should be, is that because you didn't vote for your president or because Jesus is real, your real king? Which one? Because if Jesus is my king, I'm not worried about who's president. I vote. I make the best decision I can. But life isn't fatally, uh, uh, fatally relegated to who's in the White House. God's not up there saying, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh. There's a higher power. Solomon said it himself, and he said that as king. 
And by the way, at this moment he's writing this, he is the most powerful king on the earth at that point. His empire is larger than any other empires at that moment. And he's saying, there's a higher person than me. He's the one who really is running things. Solomon said in Proverbs, the king can make the decision, but the end of the decision falls to the Lord. He said that about himself in Proverbs. Here's what he says next in these verses. He says, but this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. All right, so you want to know the Bible's perspective on voting for politicians? All right, here it is. In the first verse here, in verse 8, he says we have a problem because he says some people are, are violent to the poor and they're a vi violation of justice. And then there's some people who are a violation of justice and righteousness. And when you look at our political parties, one leads towards social justice and one leads towards economic success. And both of those can go too far to the left or to the right. They both have major flaws. Neither one is gospel-centered. Because the gospel teaches us that the world revolves around God. God has given Jesus to make life better, to bring us back to himself. And so my life should be about others, loving God with my heart, soul, mind, strength, and loving my neighbor as myself. And so Solomon says the best king is a king who's concerned with human flourishing, a system where people work hard and they receive the just rewards for their work. Pretty cut and dry. Now, you find a politician more committed to cultivated fields than his own campaign or maintaining his own seat or maintaining his reputation, you'll find a good politician. I haven't seen one in a very long time. Here's the point. Talk about Jesus more than your political party. Because Jesus cares about the cultivated fields. He said, my field is white under harvest. Are there any laborers? He cared about people. That's the field we care about. Do people have the opportunity to hear the gospel, to thrive under the teachings of the gospel? Do we have a country where we can continue to preach the gospel? That's the field that matters. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's make that the thing we talk about. Let's make that the person we talk about. Number four. Remember that accumulating wealth will not bring satisfaction. Accumulating wealth will not bring satisfaction. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Here's what he says in verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So if I live in a value system, a value narrative... I'm going to get more money. I want more money. I deserve more money. Or if I live in a victim system, a victim narrative, you're not paying me enough. I deserve more. You're holding back from me. And then you read the New Testament, and Jesus says, you don't deserve anything. What do I deserve? Death, hell, and the grave is what I deserve, according to the gospel. A couple things to think about with this. First of all, Dissatisfaction with our finances can cause us to make injurious decisions. Here's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. He says, There is a grievous evil that, is, has, that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And so what he's saying here is when I just desire money, I desire money, I desire more, I desire more, I begin to make decisions that in my mind will advance me in my finances, and sometimes those decisions are irrational, and they're dangerous, and they cause devastation to my family. Listen, if you have worked your whole life to retire, and you retire a lonely person because your kids are estranged from you because you were never home, you made a lot of money, and you lost everything. You know, the easy thing to point out is gambling, right? Well, you lost some money, you tried to get it back, you gambled more, you gambled more, you gambled more, you gambled more. And we criticize that, and we should criticize that, but some of you are gambling with your family to try to achieve success in a career. And it's not going to come out okay. You're going to lose a lot. It's 
Here's another thing we see here in Ecclesiastes. Dissatisfaction with our finances blinds us to the blessings of what we already do possess. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, it says, All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. I love that thought. You're so focused on what you don't have, the sight of your eyes is missing all that you have. Some of the most dissatisfied people I meet are people who have forgotten the blessings of what they already have. If you live in this country, you're blessed. If you're at church this morning, you are richly blessed. If you have a family who loves you, you're blessed. Some of you don't have a family who loves you. That's a hardship. If you drove a car here this morning, if you have clothes on, nice clothes, I have a shirt from Chad. I love this shirt, Chad. Thank you. <laughs> if they ever put me on preacher sneakers, I'm going to tell them, Chad, buy my clothes. <laughs> if you're clothed this morning, if you had food this morning, if you had coffee, you don't need coffee. Coffee is one of the rich blessings of God in your life. <laughs> you can live without coffee. All right? If you can't, you have a spiritual issue. I am one of those. But you don't need coffee. Coffee is a blessing. God's like, oh, you want food? I'll give you coffee too. Yes, thank you, God. Right? Don't miss the blessings you have for the things that you feel victimized in not having. I guarantee you, you have more than someone else. And not just more than someone else in a third world country. I guarantee you have more than someone else on your street. I guarantee it. Don't miss it. Number five. Here's a positive. I said a bunch of don'ts. Here's a do. Recognize the good in your context and center your mind there. Recognize the good in your context and center your mind there. That's why I keep telling you, don't get wrapped up in the negativity of the news media. There are some good things happening in life. Let's, let's live there, all right? This is from a critical negative thinker. I'm telling you to be positive. Now, to do that, I have a wife. So some of you need your spouse for this, all right? I wake up, and usually the first thing I say is something negative. And my wife's like, oh, can we start our day positive? Yeah, we'll start our day positive. <laughs> Cup of coffee, and I'll do that, all right? Here's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He says this in verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. I came in the house happy yesterday, and my wife said, why are you so happy? I said, I was outside picking up leaves, fixing the yard. In the fall, I'll say I had a miserable day. Why? I had to pick up leaves all day. I'm sick of it, Right? But in the spring, I appreciate that opportunity. It got almost 50 degrees yesterday. It was fantastic. I had a short sleeve shirt on. I'm like, this is heaven. It's interesting how our perspectives change, right? Verse 19, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. We have to practice the process of gratitude. But to do this, we have to actually lower our expectations of what we think we deserve or we think has been held back from us. We've got to get rid of the value narrative. We've got to let go of the victim narrative. Now, let me make a quick caveat here. Should we care about those who've been victimized? We should. Is it a bad thing we have a month to remember victimization, no, it's not a bad thing. Just don't make that thing the God thing. In fact, if you want to inform that thing, bring God into that thing. Because God cares about those people who have been victimized. And God wants you to be his hands and feet for those people. And we can take a really worthy cause and make it the cause, and then we make that the God thing, and our faith begins to fall apart. What is the template for God-centered worship and God-centered living? Well, actually, Jesus gave it to us in a way you may not have expected. The template for God-centered worship and living was given to us by Jesus himself in the Lord's Prayer. 
If you can understand the Lord's Prayer, you can understand what life is supposed to look like and how we are supposed to uh, write the narratives of our life around the gospel. And here's what he says in the Lord's Prayer, right? Matthew chapter 6. He says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy or set apart is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, just what we need for today, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. All right? If I'm going to ask forgiveness, I already have to have forgiven. So there's this order here. I have forgiven, and now I am, I'm able to ask God for true forgiveness. And then he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, so what is my life about? How do I keep it about the right thing and not about the me things? Well, first of all, we have to remember God's name. God's name is his name. It's not my name. My name is Christian or Christ one. It isn't Rob one. I don't want God to be like me. I want to be like him. Okay? And so when I pray, when I pursue things in life, when I think about my life, I need to be asking the question, God, is this about you or is this about me? Is your name going to be praised in this? That's where I start. Is, can your name be praised through this? That's fine. You want a boat? That's great. Boats are great. Can you use that for God? You can. But it's got to be about God. Remember, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So if he takes away your boat and you get angry and walk away from your faith, then it was about the boat. All right? I'm actually thankful for people in our church who have boats because they let me go on their boat and I don't have to buy one. It's awesome. <laughs> so if it's about me, it, I guess that's egocentric, isn't it? Never mind. <laughs> Secondly, God's will. God's will. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the, the next question is, is, is this about his kingdom? Is this about the advancement of the gospel? Can, can I be about this cause or this desire and make it about God being honored and Jesus being preached? Well, that takes a lot of things off the table. I'll tell you one thing that takes off the table, how much television we watch and how much we put into our minds. Very little of what we entertain ourselves with is about the kingdom. Very little. Number three, he says, let's talk about needs. There are needs. We have needs. But he says, my needs are about what God wants to provide for me today, not what I want next year or 10 years from now or my 10-year plan. Those aren't bad things. It's good to plan. But if I can be satisfied with what God gives me today, then I can make my life about God. And so Jesus says, don't ask for everything, just ask for what you need. If God gives you more, that's a blessing. God, give me breakfast. And if you give me coffee on the side, that's a blessing. I just need breakfast. That's enough. Just the bread for today. We used to say it this way, we ought to know the difference between our needs and our greeds. You'd be amazed at how much is actually greeds and not needs. We're talking about food shortages in this country. And, of course, by talking about food shortages, we create food shortages because everybody panics, and they go buy all the food, right? I'm going to tell you there's not really such a thing as a food shortage in this country. You want to understand a food shortage? You spend two weeks in Haiti. You spend two weeks in the Dominican or in Africa. That's food shortage. People eating rice and beans once a day. We might not get organic beef for a couple weeks. All right? Huge difference. Don't miss it. Don't get so ground down in your own frustrations about what you can't have that you miss how blessed you are every day to have what you have. Pastor Eddie's finally got the water on for his parents. God bless you guys. And now you understand the value of turning a thing and water comes out. It's a miracle. There's still people in this world that don't have that who take a bucket, my brother included when he's on the field, take a bucket for two miles to get water and bring it back to the house and boil it before they can drink it. And you go, whoop, 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 water. Amazing. It's a miracle. It is. And then he talks about debts. Now, he's not talking about financial debts here, although that sometimes can be included in this. He's talking about sin debt. He says, you want to talk to God about forgiving your sins, and you should, but are you forgiving others too? Let's start there. Go forgive others. Forgive them what they've done to you. That doesn't mean you condone their actions, but you forgive them in your heart. And then you say, God, I'm forgiving them. Can you forgive me? God is expecting you to become like him. If he's going to actively forgive you, you should actively forgive others. And so am I going to do something, or am I going to respond in such a way where there's not forgiveness in my heart? Victim narratives, this is huge. I will never forgive that type of person. 
I will victimize them because I feel like a victim of them. Talking to someone who has been abused, you've read my book, all right? I could live my whole life as a, as a victim and, and live the victim's life and, and be sour and bitter and angry and feel like everybody owes me something because I was victimized as a child. Or I can recognize God used that in my life. It's ugly, it's dark, it's sinful, and I'm thankful it's over, but I am not a prisoner of that situation. I am free. And I can move forward in victory. My purity. This is where he ends, all right? You've poured out your heart to God. You said, God, I want my life to be about you. I want to just have what I need. I can be satisfied with that. Don't, don't, don't let me settle for greeds. Help me to forgive because I know you're forgiving me. Help me to be able to be about your kingdom. But finally, there's one important piece here. God, keep me pure. Keep me pure. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from myself, from the evil in my heart and soul. Keep me pure. If you aren't actively pursuing purity, you have no right to ask for the rest of it. Now, you can, and God still loves you, and there's still grace, and he will even still provide a lot of things for you, but he wants to start with your purity. Paul said, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's where it starts. That's the will of God. You understand the will of God? It starts with your purity. Here's our application this morning. Egocentricity can creep into life subtly, all right? Making life about myself can happen very subtly, and it can take hostage a life of worship, changing the worship of God into the worship of self or worship of an issue or worship of a thing. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 says, the devil prowls around about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's, he's crouching in the bushes. He's just waiting for the opportunity to make a narrative, a true narrative in our heart and life. And so we must hold on at all costs to the gospel narrative. Why do I say all costs? Because sometimes holding on to the gospel narratives means you let go of some things. Let me just give you a really easy place to start. Sometimes the gospel narrative, to hold on to that and keep that center in our life, we've got to get off social media. We just have to. You actually can live life without Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, especially TikTok, all right? You can actually live life without those things. Did you know there was life before those things? <laughs> Twitter, actually, when it came out in the early aughts, was coined the thing we needed before we knew we needed it. How bogus is that? We do not need Twitter. Honestly, I just deleted my Twitter account just a couple weeks ago. The Christians on there are so angry and um, vindictive. I didn't want to be associated with that anymore. I got off it. I'm really looking for an excuse to get rid of the rest of them because <laughs> I'm kind of antisocial anyway. <laughs> Honestly, we do this, 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 and you can, and you can realize, man, I just did this for an hour, and all I saw was negative and things, it, it, things feeding into my value narrative or my victim narrative. Nothing that speaks against this. In fact, that's all social media is. My value narrative and my victim narrative. This is my value narrative. This is my victim narrative. Ugh. That's really all it is. I praise God for our women's ministry. You guys are using social media in an incredible way. Ashley, where are you? Your devotionals are so good. I'd like to use them for our men's ministry, but we have Sean too, so, you know. Honestly, I'm just amazed. Keep at it. Uh, Paige, wherever she is, did our devotionals at, at uh, Christmas. So good. Uh, you ladies are astounding me at your desire to grow and learn. That's a great way to use social media. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. I have uh, raised two daughters to adulthood. And they drive very differently. I got the privilege of teaching both of them to drive way easier than teaching a son, Teddy. Good luck with that. I love your truck, man. It's going to be toast. <laughs> Stay off the sidewalks. So one of my daughters, she drives fast. She'll hit every pothole, every curb, no accidents, none. No, no, you know what's, I'm not telling them who it is. All right? The other one drives carefully. 
Methodically, I feel totally safe with her. She wrecked the car the first day she got her driver's license. <laughs> That's just how it goes. That's how it goes, all right? Tiny scratch, $1,800 tiny scratch, just so you know. <laughs> I feel totally victimized by it, by the way. No. Now, here's the interesting thing with potholes, all right? You drive on potholes, and I, I got the car back one time. I lent, lent it to one of my kids, I got it back, and the thing, I literally had the steering wheel straight, and the car was going zzzz. I'm like, what is going on here? The car is going crooked. And so I called, I said, did you, did, did something happen? No, no, I, I, she hardly drove it. I said, did you hit a pothole? I did hit a pothole. Was it a deep pothole? Yeah, it was a pretty deep pothole. All right, I know why the uh, alignment's off now, okay? Now, you guys understand cars enough to know when your alignment's off, I mean, I had a car one time, I'm, the steering wheel was like this, and I was going straight, you know, and I wasn't going to fix it. Eventually, all these little potholes and curbs and snow and everything gets this wheel off to the right or the left, and one wheel, just a degree off, is hurting your gas mileage, it's hurting your tires, it's pulling the car in the direction it's not supposed to go, and it's frustrating. So every once in a while, you get that car back in, you say the alignment's off, they get it realigned, they get those wheels centered. All right, now that's what the spiritual life can look like. Right? This is balance, this balance. I, I, I want to care about social justice. I, I want to care about righteousness and holiness. I want to do the right thing. I want to balance grace and law because there is law to teach me I, I can't keep the law, and there's grace when I don't keep the law, but God has a standard, and I need to be pure. It's all these balances in Scripture, and the Scripture is always balanced. But what knocks that balance off is the potholes of life. Some of those potholes are things we didn't see coming. We didn't know they were there. We hit them accidentally, and life hits, and, and we've got to have a readjustment. God, that was a struggle. And sometimes we're like, pothole, sweet. And we just go for it. And it feels like it only took the alignment off just a degree, and yet that one degree, after 10 miles, I am five miles in that direction. And all of a sudden, I look back over, and I'm, wow, how did I get over here? Well, you took something that was important, something that was maybe a good thing or something that was an important thing to fight and you made that the thing and that took off your alignment. And you didn't realize it. It happened so subtly. This can happen on social media. It can happen reading celebrity theologians. It can happen in politics. It can happen too much news media can do this. Academia, all right, kids, high school students especially. I am keep talking about it, keep filtering. Love your teachers, they love you, but not all your teachers love Jesus, and they're gonna try to teach you a narrative that is false. Keep asking questions, keep learning, keep, keep talking to your parents, reading the Bible. Hollywood hates the gospel narrative, all right? They certainly don't live it out. It's completely hypocritical. Doctors these days, I love our doctors. Our doctors serve us, they love us, but your doctor has no right to tell you not to go to church. There's no out clause in the Bible for COVID. Assemble yourselves together that you may be equipped and edified and encouraged. We have to work at it, all right? Got to remember the narrative. Parents, we have to be careful with the narratives we're spinning. Pastors, us, we can give false narratives. We can make life about victimization or value. And of course, this is the worst one. You might be surprised, but friends who tell us only what we want to hear. Those are the most dangerous. Love our good friends, but better friends are friends who are going to tell you what you don't want to hear. What's the gospel say? Because I think you're off to the right or left. Those are the friends you want to keep around. Don't surround yourself with people who only tell you what you want to hear. God, it's a joy to talk about this today. I needed this for my own heart. I struggle with these narratives just like everybody else does. Sometimes I feel like I deserve more than I have. Sometimes I feel like I'm undervalued. And every time I begin to struggle with those things, Father, I'm getting my eyes on myself. I'm believing the world is revolving around me and not around the gospel. And so, God, we all need your help to readjust, realign. We're going to hit the potholes. It's going to happen. And so we need your help to readjust, realign, to keep our lives centered, revolving around you, your righteousness in our hearts and lives, how it changes us, and now how we can love you and love others. Keep our hearts, our minds right there at whatever cost it may cost us. And we'll thank you in advance for how you do that. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand and close in a song together.